on this edition of Native Report. We attend the Northern Plains Indian Art Market in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. While in Sioux Falls, we also learn about the South Dakota Urban Indian Health Center. And from the Native Report archives, we look back at our visit to the Journey Museum in Rapid City. We also learn something new about Indian Country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community and the Blandon Foundation. Welcome to Native Report, I'm Stacy Thunder. The annual Northern Plains Indian Art Market in Sioux Falls, South Dakota began in 1988 and was originally conceived as an economic development project, a marketplace where Native American artists could sell their artwork. Since then, the show has grown to become a national staple in showcasing American Indian art of the Northern Plains. For three days during the month of September, Sioux Falls, South Dakota is home to the Northern Plains Indian Art Market. The event showcases over 50 artists representing 22 Native nations and will draw several hundred art lovers from across the United States. The Northern Plains Indian Art Market was founded in 1988, so this is the 27th annual show. It's uh, a juried art competition and a sales market. And it started out as an economic development project. The basis was selling raw materials and, and supplies to bead workers and, uh, uh, well, even uh, regular art supplies and stuff uh, at a uh, reasonable rate to Indian artists, basically in South Dakota, so they, so they can create their, their artwork. So the next part of the idea was, well, we, we need an outlet for all of the stuff that's being created by these people out on the reservations, so we've got to have some kind of market, some kind of show. So one thing led to another, one thing led to another, one thing led to another, and pretty soon it, was a, it became a full-blown art show and market. Northern Plains Indian Art Market is kind of like a starter show for a lot of young and developing artists of the Northern Plains tribes. And after they become comfortable at our show and um, their work is good and they're talented, they start to get recognized and they may get picked up and represented by a gallery, a big gallery someplace, get, get big solo shows in, in, uh, in bigger markets, in New York, Los Angeles or someplace. And then they start winning at some of the more larger shows, uh, comes to mind right away, the, the Santa Fe Indian market. Um, they tend to not be able to come back, not that they don't want to, it's just that they sell out, and good for them. We have a, a healthy array of traditional and contemporary fine arts and traditional work. Sinta Glushka University on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota took over production of the Market and Juried Show in 2004. Journey out there? Yeah. On this day, Artist Lynn Burnett is putting the finishing touches on his booth. When I was little, I, I sketched. I sketched everything. I sketched horses, people, anything I, I could. I tried to sketch and because I was told by a relative that I'd never be an artist. So I told, I knew I'd, I'd prove him wrong. The brown background I do with instant tea on watercolor paper. I put the watercolor paper down, tape it down, pour water on it, and then sprinkle the instant tea because it's in crystals. So as soon as it hits water, it spreads and runs. And I just let it run wherever it wants to. And then uh, look at it and see what I'm gonna put in there. And it works real well. 
I have another show I do in, in Kansas. We go to that one and we come straight here for this one and we wouldn't miss this one for nothing. It's a tradition. Most of the pieces that I do, I, I find things that touch me, that make me feel emotional uh, uh, about it. And usually it's, it's often Lakota people, turn of the century black and white photographs are one of my main sources. I try to capture that person and bring them into the modern world by basically colorizing the photograph. So it's tile work, it's enameling on glass, and then it's a lot like stained glass in how you design it. You make your pattern and then you cut out all your pieces and then in stained glass you foil it, but in, in um, mosaic you, you just glue it down and then you have to mortar it. And each phase of the process is pretty difficult to master. You just have to keep messing with it until you figure out what it is you like and then move on from there. It's very, very similar to beading and quilt work. While the artists prepare for the market to open, workers at the Washington Pavilion are also putting finishing touches on displays for the juried art show. The curators of that facility and some volunteer curators professional curators are hanging the exhibition that's going to be shown tonight at the reception. And uh, the audience gets to view um, all of the winning pieces of the 17 divisions of the Jury Dart competition. We're prestigious and we're probably the premier Indian market in the Northern Plains area. Oils, acrylics, watercolors, tempuras, uh, they're going to see a lot of flat work as, as paintings are called, uh, sculpture, jewelry, handmade dolls, pottery. In the traditional divisions, um, they're going to see pieces that harken back to uh, 19th century types of, of, of clothing and accoutrement like moccasins, dresses, even some uh, coats in the textile divisions. I was with the show when it started and we saw th there are several of us who have been involved for a long, long time. Uh, we saw the potential of what this could be. And uh, you're doing it for the artist, you're doing it for the uh, continuation of the appreciation of American Indian art and, and watching American Indian art evolve in the 27 years of this show. Uh, there are new things, there are new materials being utilized in the creation of, of, of art pieces. But we're pretty proud of, of, of what we do and what we put on, and the artists love it. Did you know that on the Great Plains, American Indian men and women played different roles in the creation of art? According to the late Dr. Mary Schneider of the University of North Dakota, a characteristic of Plains Indian art was the fairly strict division between art made and used by men and art made and used by women. Although men and women sometimes cooperated, women usually painted or quilled very balanced, controlled, geometrical designs on dresses, moccasins, robes, bags, and containers. Men were responsible for the human and animal figures that appeared in the biographical or cosmological art. But women's art had sacred meaning too. Designs on women's clothes symbolized prayers for a long life and healthy children. Quill work was considered a sacred art. Cheyenne and Lakota women gained the right to do quill work by becoming members of societies in which the art was taught. A woman who excelled in quill work or other women's art was publicly honored in the same way as a successful warrior. Next. South Dakota Urban Indian Health is an organization dedicated to providing quality health care for Native people and the economically disadvantaged or medically underserved in the urban areas of South Dakota. One clinic is in Pier and the other in Sioux Falls.
South Dakota Urban Indian Health's mission is to provide total quality medical care for Native American people and the economically disadvantaged residing in urban areas of South Dakota. On most days, Donna Keeler and her staff meet for a morning huddle, which begins with the recitation of their mission statement. But more importantly, it brings everyone together at least one time during the day. As a nonprofit corporation, everybody here needs to know what our mission is in order to fulfill it. And in order to provide really high quality care for Native Americans and understand that, you need to know what your mission statement is. So we always start with our mission statement. And then we talk about who's going to be here today, what special events are going on today, who's in, who's out, what's our staffing dynamics, do we need transportation for patients, those kinds of things. We have two full-time clinics. We have the clinic here in Sioux Falls, and then I operate a full-time primary health care facility also in Pier, which um, they sit about three hours apart from each other. We are a Title V urban Indian health program. And so out of the Indian Health Care Improvement Act, Title V originally designated the definition of what an urban Indian is, and then also established urban Indian health programs. And so when we incorporated in 1977, we came, on, we came in under the Title V uh, authority. We operate an integrated systems of care here, so we operate medical along with the behavioral health, which includes mental health and substance abuse. I have a total of right now, and we've got a couple of positions vacant, but we have a, about a 32 base staff at a total for both sides. South Dakota Urban Indian Health draws patients from a seven county area around Sioux Falls. On average, the clinic sees well over 20,000 patients annually. We not only see native patients, but we see non-native patients here as well. The facilities are accredited through the AAAHC. Uh, we're also a AAAHC medical home facility, and we're a federally qualified health center. So when you broaden your base for accreditation, you really need to serve a whole population base. The focus, of, however, of our mission, obviously, is to make sure that we um, provide access to quality care for Native Americans. So um, we make sure that we have appointment times that are available to make sure that any Native American that needs health care can come here. In the Great Plains region, we still rank extremely high in diabetes, as well as high substance abuse, mental health. When we look at our top five diagnosis, those, those two or three um, specific diseases are always in the top five. One of the reasons why we run an integrated systems of care is because in our traditional room, which has a medicine wheel built into the ceiling, it's a daily reminder that we don't treat somebody just for a specific diagnosis of what they're presenting for today, a sore throat, um, flu-like symptoms. We treat them in a holistic manner of making sure that we look at the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual quadrants of every single patient every time we see them. Donna stresses that it is not enough to tell a person to eat healthier, get more exercise, or to lose weight. Patient education is just as important in this holistic approach to a person's well-being. We have our diabetic care managers take clients in, and the first tour that we take, we let them just shop we don't really engage with instruction. We just go with them and follow them. We come back here and we go through the groceries that they've bought and we talk about you know, what are really high processed and what are things that they really need to stay away from. If it's high sodium, we show them, okay, in these categories, this is, these aren't really good for you. Or if you need to stay away from saturated fats. So we, we physically take their groceries and kind of show them what was good and what was bad. It's a successful way that you teach them by letting them do it. And then not saying, oh, well, this was really a bad choice. It's not criticism, it's more of an education. We are in the physical activity room. And uh, we s started this through our SDPI grant funds. And it's open to all of our active patients, free of charge. 
We do a preliminary assessment on their physical ability to be on a machine. And then we had a physiologist help us develop initial exercise plans. But the diabetic care manager is really the person that brings them in, gives them instructions. They have to have instructions on what the equipment is and how to start it, how to stop it. We have a diabetes program that's fairly large. This is what our diabetes care manager's office looks like. One of the things that we've tried to do is make this more of a home setting, uh, definitely not a clinical setting, so that when patients come in and meet with their care manager, they have a conversation about their care as opposed to a direction from a nurse or a provider telling them about their care. And we call them care managers instead of case managers deliberately because we're trying to care for the patient. If there is one thing that Donna would like the public to know about South Dakota Urban Indian Health, it is that they provide quality care and services to its clients. I think a lot of times, especially in non-native, it's, well, that's an Indian clinic. And somehow that connotation or that statement makes it seem like we're substandard or that we're less than a real clinic and we're not and actually people that come here besides patients are amazed and impressed with what we do on the budget that we have and the care that we provide we're accredited nationally we're meeting quality standards nationally uh, we were the 106th program in the nation to become a Triple HC medical home. We're a state alcohol accredited program. I would like people to understand that we operate 34 urban Indian health programs in the nation. And we are doing amazing work at all of them. And that we are viable, reliable health clinics in our communities. It would just be nice to have that initial reaction be, oh my, it's an urban Indian health program, and be that a very positive statement. My dad's name, uh, well, he's been gone about two years now, two and a half. And his name was Tabado Kasapa Itokab Najinshni, which means do not stand in front of the black buffalo. <laughs> and uh, they, his father gave him that name when he was just a few minutes old. Held him up to the stars around midnight when he was born in those direction. Welcome him to those relatives. Because we say we come from the stars, and to the stars we return. We come from the earth, to the earth we return. We really mean that uh, because those are the buffalo stars, particularly. It's, uh, and there's places on earth that match those places in the sky. Specifically, as the Wakpa Tanka or Haha Wakpa, what here people would say Mississippi, we called here uh, is the Wanagi Tachanku, also the Milky Way River of Stars. They match. So there's a cave by the river down here that match a star in that buffalo constellation up by the Milky Way. So like those teepee poles, they connect us literally between places here, places there. It's like a mirror. The focus of this week's story from the Native Report archives is the Journey Museum in Rapid City, South Dakota where the Lakota are sharing the story of their people in their own way. Every year, hundreds of visitors tour the Journey Museum in Rapid City, South Dakota. This world-class facility is actually made up of four different museums, which work together to tell the story of the Black Hills. Their story of cooperation goes back to 1985. So they brought in not only the School of Mines Museum, but also the State Archaeological Research Center, the Sioux Indian Museum, and the Pioneer Museum to come together under one roof 
And so, wow, that would really be great, but how do we work this out? We've got two state entities, one federal, one private. While a task force worked to financially stabilize the organization and build a permanent home, museum representatives worked with a professional design team on how the story of the journey would be told. We got together a committee, a Lakota advisory committee. We asked people from the, the Cheyenne River, the Rosebud, and the Pine Ridge, um, the eastern part of the state, to join us, to work with us on this issue. And uh, when the exhibit designers developed this storyline of how they seen the museum to be, uh, the advisory committee looked at that and uh, basically redid, edited a lot of the uh, ideas. Visitors start their own journey through the museum with an introduction to the sacred Black Hills. Lakota elders call the Black Hills Hesamba, the heart of everything that is, and the heart beats a rhythm. Our legends tell us that all of the universe was given a song, and each part of the universe was given a piece of the song. But only in the Black Hills can the whole song be heard. In the heart of the museum, layers of rock are peeled back for visitors to see the geological foundations of the Black Hills. Next, people are drawn into an archaeological dig to see some of the impressive fossils that have been found in this region. Then visitors come to the Lakota part of the story which is provided by the Sioux Indian Museum, a federal collection from the U.S. Department of the Interior. The Sioux Indian Museum, when it was first started, was in 1939. So we've been around for a long time. The museum tells the story of the Lakota way of life before contact with Europeans, as well as their struggle to hold on to lands during America's westward expansion. But this is not just a story of what was. Besides being a museum of historic objects, we have contemporary objects as well. I would say it's probably 40, 60 percent, 60 percent contemporary. Um, part of our mission is to promote contemporary Indian artists and craftsmen who are enrolled members of federally recognized tribes. We have probably done, since 1969, over 200 special exhibits promoting contemporary Indian arts and crafts, just here at this uh, museum alone. And then we have two sister museums, one in Anadarko, Oklahoma, and one in uh, Browning, Montana. And in our exhibits here at the Journey Museum, we uh, show both the historic objects, and then we will also have a contemporary piece maybe right next to that. But that's to show the general public that the Native American people, the Lakota people, are still alive and well and still producing great, beautiful pieces of work and using the same techniques, colors, and styles that were done 100 plus years ago. It's a, a continuum of tradition and culture. The museum works hard to display only what's appropriate under direction from Lakota elders in the area. There's objects that uh, we used to have on display that I was really concerned about and whether or not to display them or not in the new facility. And so I spoke with a, um, an elder that lived here in Rapid City about it and told him my concerns. And he said, well, it's best to do this. It's best not to do this until we see how it goes. From the Lakota exhibits, visitors move into the pioneer part of the story to learn about the experiences of white settlers in the region. Clashes of culture and the toll they have taken on nations and families are all part of the story of the journey. A lot of the comments that uh, we get from the visitors is they'll, they'll come through, they'll see everything, 
and maybe at the end of their tour, some of them feel just almost devastated because of uh, what their ancestors did to the Native American people. But hey, that was history. Um, you can't change it. That's how histories develop, and that's how cultures develop. And um, it's just a coming together. And this, I think, shows and proves that people can come together. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us at nativereport.org, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you for spending time with us here on Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. Stacy Thunder is Ojibwe from the Red Lake and Lakota Ray Nations and is the legislative counsel for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. Professor Ted Johnson is the director of the Master of Tribal Administration and Governance program at the University of Minnesota Duluth and is an enrolled member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community and the Blandon Foundation. Closed captioning is provided by the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa.